Well, thank you all, and thank you, Yvonne. Um, we've got something special for you today. Uh, how many people read the news uh, in the last 24 hours about McClatchy? All right, we'll talk about technology, we'll talk about media and democracy uh, in this panel and session today. Um, as Yvonne said, um, I'm the CEO of the Computer History Museum, which I'd like to say after 20 years has just three weeks ago uh, evolved and changed its mission. And our focus is on decoding technology, the computing past, digital present, which is what we're going to talk about today, and the future impact on humanity. And our goal is to shape a better future. So you all have to pay attention to this panel because there are going to be some guideposts to think about, about what you can do to make a difference. Hmm. Life today doesn't exist without computing. It's inextricably linked to these complicated systems that underpin industry and our infrastructure. And at the same time, they challenge our core beliefs and what it's held to be a human being in the modern world. It's something that affects everyone every day. With that in mind, I want to thank Joint Venture Silicon Valley for having us back this year and encouraging this extremely timely topic and conversation about the interconnected nature of technology, media, and our democracy. And as has been pointed out over the course of this conference, Silicon Valley as a place uh, has been maligned in so many different ways for issues around security, issues around privacy, fake news, deep fakes, but the topic is really not about Silicon Valley, and it's really not about technology per se. And I would say that technology, as we all know, has democratized access to information, and you'll hear about this in the panel presentation. You know, from the printing press to the internet, it's always been a new technique that's to let people communicate more openly and aggressively. But it's also breaking down the ethics and the structure and creating growing skepticism in society for all sorts of reasons. This is a huge topic, and you've heard a lot about it in the earlier conversations. It's too big to cover in the 30 minutes that we have today. So what we're going to do today is focus in on the multifaceted nature of the problem, the roles, responsibilities, the actors, and the actions that are required by each and we want to learn a little bit about what it is, why it is important to have accurate information and a common language framework from which we can all deal with our digital present. As was said, Richard Gingras brings three decades of experience in digital media, including at Google, where he now serves as the VP of News. He's also a member of the Commissioner on the Night from the Knight Commission on Media, Trust, and Democracy. He's been a major contributor in the industry on that front. And Sally, as was mentioned, is a longtime journalist covering medicine and science policy with significant emphasis on social diversity, which is fundamental to these conversations today. She's been honored with the Peabody Award. She's been on the Knight Fellowship at Stanford, and she has founded the Trust Project, it's affiliated with Santa Clara University. California primaries, two weeks away, president, presidential election in November. Um, as citizens and leaders in Silicon Valley, and more broadly in our democracy, we all have a role to play. So I'll encourage you to listen closely to the two panel presentations before our uh, panel conversation, uh, because you just might find out the role that you have to play in this problem. So please, uh, let me invite Richard to the stage, who will be followed by Sally. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel, uh, and thank you. It's indeed a privilege and an honor to speak with you here today. In 1994, the World Wide Web had fewer than 3,000 websites. Today, there are more than 1.7 billion websites, an explosion of expression beyond what the world has ever seen or could have fully imagined. Simply put, the internet put a printing press in everyone's hands. Everyone has the opportunity to share their voice in the public square and beyond the public square. It changed how we communicate, how we shop, how we sell, all of our behaviors. It changed how we are informed of the issues of the day, how we form opinions about issues of the day, how we develop our perceptions of the world around us and of each other. It has never been easier for small and less heard voices to speak. 
Maybe they're on the other side of the world. Maybe they're right next door. It has never been easier for political and civic organizations to communicate, coordinate, and mobilize, often benefiting voices that were perhaps left aside by existing political organizations. It has never been easier for people to find health information, for farmers to find market information, for young and old to learn new skills. The internet exponentially expanded both the marketplace for information and the marketplace for ideas. It has brought extraordinary value to our societies. Yes, the internet can elevate noble speech, that which appeals to our better angels, but as we all well know, it can also enable harmful speech, from outright disinformation to the massive amounts of opinion that misrepresent facts and fiction. It has introduced disruptive challenges to our institutions, to the media ecosystem, to the world of politics and public policy. Yes, the internet and real-time communications has given the political class the ability to circumvent the press and play to their constituencies or their bases in real time. And yes, that appears to be having a rather deleterious effect on a representative, deliberative democracies around the world. Can we find a path back to objective truth in a pursuit of consensus via thoughtful deliberation? Or do we slide into alternate realities or what C. Wright Mills might consider the tyranny of the majority, whichever one is the majority at that time? Existentially, it poses the paradoxical question, how can democracies survive and thrive in an environment of unfettered free expression? As we are all aware, misinformation and disinformation are as old as civilization itself. Ask Plato. It didn't begin with the internet. It is not isolated to any particular ideology. But the internet has expanded the means of free expression and the amplification of that expression. It has given each of us the means to find the affirmation we prefer versus the information we require. Several years back, Google helped enable the global ecosystem of fact-checking organizations, a great effort with positive effects. But it too runs into our human biases. We think of our species as being capable of pure reason, capable of analyzing abstract concepts to reach reasoned conclusions. However, human reason operates within social constructs. We are all predisposed to align our thinking within the social circles we are attached to. It's a survival skill. If the head of the tribe says the moon is green, we'll say, hmm, yes, indeed it is, for fear we might not get a leg of the calf. All of us have a responsibility to rethink how we address these challenges. There are no simple answers. Indeed, the solutions often proposed are rife with secondary consequences on our societies and the nature of free expression itself. As H.L. Mencken noted, every complex problem has a solution which is simple, direct, plausible, and wrong. At Google, we take our role in the ecosystem seriously. We recognize that while our search engine must strive to provide authoritative answers, we cannot be the ultimate deciders of what is or is not acceptable free expression. We recognize that freedom of speech does not guarantee freedom of reach. We cannot say it's not our problem, especially when the provenance of the content is unknown or unaccountable. That is on us. Free expression, yes. Uncontrolled amplification, no. All of us, in every institution, across our society, need to explore new methods of helping citizens obtain fact-based information about the state of their world, to help them be better informed about which issues are important and which are not. At Google, we have an effort called Data Commons, which has pulled together a vast open corpus of statistical data, largely from government sources, to help journalists and others provide citizens with a more data-driven context around the issues of the day. Can we give our communities a weather report of key metrics about, whether we need a about matters beyond whether or not we need a raincoat? 
What's the crime rate and how has it changed? The graduation rate, the air quality index, all of the important measures that truly defined the comfort of our communities and can help us understand which issues are truly problematic and which deserve the attention of our voters. But none of the solutions we envision will be effective without institutions and leaders setting the proper norms that guide the health of our societies. Yes, in 2018, I spent a year as a member of the Knight Commission on Trust, Media, and Democracy. During those deliberations, one poignant question captured the challenge we face quite well. The question is this, is the internet to the First Amendment what the AK-47 is to the second. What do I mean by that? Our societies may be ruled by laws, but the health of our societies is guided by our norms. Our societies are only as good as we are as individuals. Our societies are only as good as our leaders guide us to become. I choose to be optimistic. At Google Search, we seek solutions that can help citizens have the tools and information they need to be thoughtful, informed citizens. But the challenges we face will require the leadership of many, not the leadership of one, and that includes every one of you. Each institution in our society, from technology companies to government agencies to educational institutions to news media to our political class, needs to consider its role in assuring the availability of fact-based knowledge that our citizens need to be informed and engaged citizens. As leaders, we all need to help our citizens assess what they consume to separate fact from fiction, wisdom from spin. As leaders, we all need to provide the role models and norms that can guide the health of our societies beyond the legal constructs we live in. The success of a functional democracy requires no less. I thank you for your help in pursuing that objective. Great. Great to have you. Thank you. Well, it's a delight to be here and an honor to be here. Um, I used to cover this conference as a reporter for the San Francisco Examiner years ago, very eagerly every year, and I'm so it's just delightful to be here on this side of the stage. Um, Richard's, and both Richard and Danielle set out an important challenge to all of us, and that's in fact the challenge that led me to, as I was thinking about starting the Trust Project. So um, may I have our, my slides, please? How do I... Get those started. We have a, oh, there we go. Okay, great. Um, so we all think we know the difference between information that's opinion, that's designed to sell us a pair of shoes maybe, and actual factual journalism. But how do we really know? So let me show you this, we all kind of I hope in this room can see that these sites really aren't intended to uh, inform you accurately about an issue in your community or your life. What about these? So these both present a story about a murder that happened in Concord. So a quick show of hands, which of you think the one, both of these are journalism? Don't be shy. The, who thinks the one on the right is journalism? How about the one on the left? Okay, so they look very much alike. And in fact, the one that is, um, has a little K2GCC at the top there in blue, that is a site that was put together by a set of police departments in the East Bay. The one on the right will be familiar to you, so it's a little bit of an unfair question. It's KRN TV in San Francisco. So. One, only one of those is real journalism that is intended to help you make your own decisions. The other one is presented to you with very much probably the same facts, but, not, but presented in a way that will help the police department perhaps find what really went on there. So the idea behind the Trust Project is how can we help people differentiate between information that may be perfectly good but isn't designed to serve the social, the public good. How can we provide 
help to the folks who are out there kind of adrift on a sea of information looking for facts they can use and provide machine readable signals to technology platforms that are now the key way that we get news. And so um, how can we give them the same information and kind of recapture this role of journalism as the guidepost to accurate news that is fairly reported and meant to be um, impartial and, um, and provide the tools to help people make decisions. So this was the idea of the Trust Project, and I knew that journalists have been talking about these questions for a long time, so I wanted to talk with people and really understand what it is that people value in the news, when do they trust it, and when don't they. So we went out and talked to people, and we got very similar answers across race, class, gender, generation, and in the US and Europe. And so I'll just go through a few of these for you. The main one was, what is your agenda? We understand journalists aim to be impartial, but everyone has an agenda, so what is yours? Another one was the journalist. Who is this reporter? What kind of expertise do they have? Why should I trust them? Another one was how do you know what you know? People have a higher expectation now that they can go out and look for information on the web to, be, to learn how journalists get it. And do you know me? Do you know my community? Is this news locally sourced? Were you here? So here are the trust indicators on pages. What we did was we took all that information from users, we um, brought it to workshops with senior news executives and worked with them to think about how do we marry these needs and wants with journalistic values. Because ultimately what we're, we are trying to do is show the distinction between journalism and everything else. And so you'll see here on that, the largest example is La Repubblica showing on those pages, essentially, it's agenda. It's structured information that says, we aim to serve the public over anyone else. And we, the way we do that is we provide guardrails. We have an ethics policy. We, um, within that, we have clear guidelines around conflict of interest. We show, uh, we have standards around gathering news and information. And if we make a mistake, we report it. Here's when we use sources. Here's, um, here's when we name sources. Here's when we don't and why. There's information about the journalist, on, both on the article page and on a, a page about each journalist. There's even, with stories that are investigative or maybe more controversial in nature, information about how that story was built as one of the um, people we consulted described it. So they provide uh, more than links, but actual the government documents that they may have consulted and the reasons why they wrote that story. So all organizations that work with the Trust Project, they all present these on their sites, on their own, their transparency factors. And when you, you see that T mark, which you would see on the San Jose Mercury News, it means they're part of this collective effort to show how journalism is distinct and to stand up for and represent and live by the commitments um, that really do distinguish journalism. So that is, we provide truthful, verified information in context. We pro provide forums for civil exchange. We reflect the diverse groups of society so that one group can learn about another, and we uphold the public's interest. Now, doing this has, to me, really brought out an amazing amount of commitment from news organizations. They have stepped up. And that is surprising to me because we are such a competitive breed. You know, we are always wanting to be first out there and the best. And so we've been able to get everyone together and agree on things and create a common language. And so I just show you this as one example of how we've attempted to do that. And had really good successes. So here you see the Washington Post um, and Corriere della Sera showing that these two articles are analysis and they're not opinion, they're not regular news. And they use an explanation that is the same on both sites. So we worked with senior news executives across the world and we continue to work with them to come up with this common lexicon. And then you'll see the one at the bottom there, KCRA, is um, a Hearst television site they're showing a very different user experience because that story is not news. It's not even a, a side of news like opinion might be considered. It is, an, it is advertising copy. And then the South China Morning Post is showing even what I just love. They're actually 
color coding news versus opinion. And this, all of this comes directly from what people are asking for as they try to understand what, what is different about news and is this a piece of information I can actually trust to help me make decisions. So here we are developing this, this language around the world and you can see all the places we are in right now, um, sites developing the trust indicators and working together. We work with um, news partners that implement the trust indicators. We also work with technology platforms to um, use the trust indicators in display and their algorithms. Here we have um, just an example from Facebook where their context button is showing the trust indicators uh, explaining their best practices, so uh, corrections, ethics, and so on, to help people differentiate. Google has been a supporter from the very start. So, in conclusion, I just want to bring us back to the original question that Danielle raised, which is, we all have a role to play in building a healthy information ecosystem. So perhaps one day we will be working with you, perhaps one day you will be building your own kind of project in this area. So thank you very much. Great. So, so thank you, Richard. Thank you, Sally. I'm just going to make a quick point that um, there may be nothing new going on. In the 1940s, there was a commission uh, called the Hutchins Commission which was headed by the president of the University of Chicago. He was the chair. And they were evaluating the print and broadcast media as well as the motion picture industry because they felt freedom of the press was in danger. And there was a concentration of ownership. There was concern about sensational news and that the media needed to take more responsibility for their actions. And the dangers that they pointed out were that the importance of the press has greatly increased with the development of the press as an instrument of mass communications. But at the same time, it has greatly decreased the proportion of people who could express their opinions. Think about that relative today. Second, they were concerned that those who controlled the machinery were not providing an adequate service to society. And then finally, that the press had engaged from time to time in practices which society condemns and which have continued would be cause for government oversight or regulation. This is in the, in the late 40s and 50s. So here we are today. So let me ask a question of the panelists. What role do you think government or regulation should play in this state of affairs as we have today? You've each expressed perspectives on sort of industry commitment to evolving, but should there be a government role? Richard? You know, I have over the last several years uh, spent my time uh, pretty much around the world addressing the challenges that we all face. Um, government regulation in any new emerging area is obviously the right of those governments, but these are particularly challenging issues, particularly when it has come to misinformation. All too often what we have seen around the world is even when the intention of the legislation is well intended, and in some places around the world it's not, then there are often secondary, deeply negative consequences on free expression itself. Right? It's just like who decides what truth is. Right. Right? These are very relative questions. So I think it has to be done in that context. What I do think any government can do in this day and age, if they believe in the value of independent journalism, is are the underlying, for instance, tax structures enabling new entities to come into play? Uh, and that is not always the case in countries around the world. So I think there are very positive things that can be done, but I think these are also very, very tricky issues uh, when it comes to free expression. I, I would agree, Sally. Given the trust project and you're sort of the underpinning of the media's perspective coming up, how do you see it? Well, I was, I've been thinking about this quite a bit lately because I've been thinking about that period right before um, the Hutchins Commission there and what was happening in terms of the flow of information. And so, and I do tend to think of things in an affirmative um, way. So governments really can play a very important 
important role in su supporting the free flow of information across all different kinds of um, venues, whether it be journalism or the arts or um, language, to fulfill those same um, elements, which is helping people know about one another and understanding like the diverse components of society as they change and grow. And then also uh, providing access to education, to forums for civic debate. These are places where we learn about one another, where we learn about civic engagement. Our effort within journalism is to provide you the information that you need to have those kinds of debates, the accurate information. Government, at every level, and not just government, but civic organizations can help propel um, more thoughtful, engaged civic debate, and that's something that I feel we're, we're really missing right now. Yeah, I think, I mean, just reflecting on both of those statements, I think it goes back to some of the opening constructs here, which is that in functioning democracies, if you have a belief in the underlying system, the structure of government as an oversight process is really uh, only or let's say best placed by serving the norms of the societal and cultural and civic um, sort of goals as opposed to, to regulatory structure. And that obviously was the conclusion at that period of time in the 40s as well. So, so I'd see you know, the, the tech lash as you will if you start with Silicon Valley being, as I, as I said in my remarks and you've heard all day, you know, the concern on this issue is, is, uh, is complicated and it requires citizens' action. So that I think is maybe a takeaway on that yeah. comment um, and maybe Sally for you so in, in you know we live in a world where the line between accuracy and accurate information and, opi and opinion have been blurred mm. what's the best way in your opinion for the media channels and the social platforms to serve democracy what role I mean you frame some of it in the trust project but what other actions do you think um, the media can take yeah, so you're talking about technology or you're talking about journalism? In journalism specifically. Oh, okay. Well, as journalists, I do feel this, this is one of our trust indicators to clearly delineate the difference between news, opinion, analysis, and all the varieties of paid content. And it's turned out to be a bit of a challenging effort to try to get agreement even across, even in just one country, let alone all the countries we work in, what do those different labels mean? So to build a common lexicon, to use it, and then to very clearly differentiate when this is an opinion story, when this is a news story, and also when some, what level of fact, that's what our definitions do, is wh how much is this built upon external facts that you have developed and how much is built upon just my opinion that maybe be built on my ideas and nothing more. Mm -hmm. um, so the m more clearly we can delineate that and the less we get involved in opining on things, I think the better off we are. Same question, but for Richard on the side of the, if you will, the social platforms, we've obviously reached this state, uh, particularly given the, the news, say McClatchy news, if you will, uh, which is that you know, this organization from the 1850s uh, just declared bankruptcy. It's a collection of 20 or so significant, you know, daily news uh, 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 outlets. Um, the social platforms or the digital platforms, there's, there's so much money involved in this. How is, how, wh how is the self-policing occur when the cost structure of, in some cases, business models is tied to this? Well, you know, the interesting challenge here is that the news industry and the, and the practice of journalism is being challenged on all dimensions, right, from a business model dimension. You mentioned McClatchy. You know, to, to put it simply, you know, we used to go to newspapers when I was a kid for everything, for where you found a job, uh, for where you found a used car, for where my mom found recipes and, and, and discount coupons for, for dinner. That model no longer exists, right? They were the internet of their communities and now they're a news node on the internet. So there's no question that the legacy newspaper industry is, is, is really obviously under deep disruption. From our perspective, we do have a role, 
right? The fact is, is uh, speaking for Google search, it's important that there be a rich ecosystem of knowledge out there. It's important for our business, which thrives in open societies. So there's a lot we can and are doing to try to affect that. We've invested hundreds of millions of dollars in and will invest more. Mm -hmm. We've worked very closely with Craig Foreman and McClatchy, among many others, right. to can we help rethink the business models mm -hmm. such that there are sustainable models going forward. For instance, we've partnered in, in Oakland with Berkeley side, the successful local uh, uh, digital outlet there to do the same in Oakland. On the journalism side, here too, and I've worked a lot with Sally on this, there is a need of a reimagining of what journalism can and should be in our society today. We, we just cannot ignore that. And journalism isn't all of one kind. You know, when we look back, for instance, MIT's analysis of the impact of misinformation, they say, let's, not, let's be clear that one of the biggest problems we're facing is partisan content coming out of partisan media organizations. How does one address that? How do we recraft journalism to make sure that users in general, that citizens in general, can see it as helpful knowledge to inform them as citizens and not simply telling them what to think? How can, we, how can we help them guide their thinking, not tell them what to think? And we take that through to our work at Google as well. Right. Right? I look at the, to me, the best definition of journalism is giving people the information they need to be informed citizens. I look at Google Search's role as how can we, in our role with Google Search, give people the sources of information, diverse opinion, knowledge, explanations as well to help them be informed, engaged citizens. That's good. Well, we are running out of time. As I said, this is a huge topic, uh, way bigger than we can cover in 30 minutes. But this is a taste. And if you take a look uh, online at the Trust Project, if you take a look online at some of the things, and, and Richard, I think, speaks uh, for the industry at large and not just Google, uh, because he's participated on both sides for so long, but there have been some significant efforts in investing and, and building these new structures um, so that, again, individuals can take action. So I think the advice that I believe everyone uh, on the panel and, and I would like to offer is everyone needs to take responsibility here. It's not going to be the, the individual action, I think, as Richard said in his remarks, but instead the collective. Uh, and as we uh, think about the, the primaries and uh, everyone's ability uh, within two weeks to vote, um, cast it judiciously. So thank you for the time. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you to our panel.